sight and out of mind. Uh, while we worry about GMOs primarily in Europe, I worry most about the several trillion organisms that get transferred as ballast water that they pick up in any port after they dump their cargo, take that to another part of the world and contaminate that part of the world uh, with all those microorganisms and viruses. This has been going on ever since ships have taken on ballast water. Uh, we are doing a uh, cross-contamination. The experiment that Darwin did, every time a ship takes on ballast water, moves someplace else and dumps that water, they're moving billions to trillions of organisms and viruses around uh, to create environments that, that wouldn't normally exist. The, the audience might be interested in your adventures with national governments in, uh, uh, in your surveying their waters you know, in the, in the South Pacific. <laughs> what John's referring to, uh, it's actually almost impossible as a modern scientist today to do what Darwin was able to do. Uh, on his voyage, he, uh, uh, on a survey ship went going around uh, first South America, uh, took biological samples, uh, characterized them everywhere where he went. We now have international treaties uh, that every country owns every species within 200 miles uh, of its borders. So we found as uh, we sailed across the Pacific Ocean with a one knot current that carried uh, a million organisms per milliliter of ocean water uh, across a border, uh, they went from organisms that were international organisms to become French genetic heritage. Uh, and it, it changes the ownership, it changes uh, the, the view of science, where most states now don't want discoveries made and that information published on the internet or published in scientific journals. So we, we, we've gone the extreme opposite of open source to uh, it's very hard to find a country that doesn't want to block the publication of information of biology that's either originated in that country or drifted across its borders. Uh, at the conference, you said something about artificial life that it's not when, uh, it's not if, it's when, that it's happening and it's going to happen sooner than we think. So what is the prognosis on that? Well, just for the record, we have not yet created an, a cell driven by a man-made chromosome. Uh, based on the chromosome transplant experiment, though, uh, we know that that is definitely possible. Uh, there's a lot of barriers to it. There's uh, different mechanisms in cells where because these are, in fact, key mechanisms of evolution, if you're a cell swimming in the ocean and not only you take up a gene, but you take up a whole chromosome from another species, and it instantly transforms uh, what you do as a species. Uh, some species wanted to develop uh, mechanisms to protect them against that. There's a lot of barriers we have to overcome. Uh, I'm hopeful it will happen this year, I think. Uh, Let me talk, can I talk a bit about some of the risks? Um, Craig, you were just talking about the, the sort of almost um, criminal contamination of oceans when tankers re release ballast of seawater and, and thereby contaminate one ocean with the organisms of another. And we're all now quite used to the idea of contamination of organisms. Uh, when you go to New Zealand, you hear thrushes and blackbirds because the early settlers felt nostalgic for British birds and wanted to bring British birds. And it's criminal. The Duke of Bedford imported American grey squirrels into, into Britain and now the red squirrel is all but extinct. We're entirely used to this idea of contamination. However, what's the equivalent that we might be doing now? What if scientists of the future are unable any longer to do serious molecular taxonomy work because the scientists of the 20th and 21st centuries uh, well, let's say 21st and 22nd centuries, contaminated genomes by introducing genes from other radically different parts of the living kingdoms. Um, it's probably all right as long as very, very careful records are kept. However, you could imagine a situation in the future where the, uh, the rather strict 
separation, that at, least, at least in Freeman Dyson's middle stage of evolution, the, 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 the sexual phase, where on the whole evolution is all divergent. There's virtually no um, uh, cross-contamination of genes. If humans suddenly start cross-contaminating genes, so you have kangaroo genes in giraffes or, or melon genes in, in aardvarks, um, what are we going to, how are we going to do our molecular taxonomy? Won't it be rather like people trying to study the, the faunas and ecologies of New Zealand? So, so, Richard, I think that's the most naive question you've ever asked. Uh, and I assume you're asking it to be provocative. Uh, because, in, in fact, that's the opposite of what we see happens with evolution. So viruses move genes around from totally disparate species uh, in a very common fashion. So we, we have genes in our genome that resemble uh, some you know, from distant viruses. In fact, a third of our genome is uh, basically viral contaminant. Uh, when we sequence the smallpox genome, the smallpox genome had a half dozen clearly human-derived genes. Uh, we see bacterial genes moving in a lateral fashion from archaea to bacteria uh, to plants to single-cell eukaryotes. So we do have constant information exchange across the diversity of species on this planet. And I think it's, uh, I've never heard the term until this meeting, uh, the schoolboy howler, uh, but, but I would put that in that category, the simplistic view of biology. Are you, saying then, are you saying then that somebody who's trying to do molecular taxonomy, is this working? Are you saying, <laughs> is, is my mic not working at all? <laughs> they keep turning it on and off. Well, okay. Are you saying that a molecular taxonomist who is trying to work out, say, the taxonomy of marsupial mammals or placental mammals would be thrown out because a bacterium or a virus has at some point carried across a kangaroo gene into a jackal genome or something? You're not saying that, are you? Uh, we're saying we see evidence of every branch of life uh, in almost every genome. It depends on which gene you choose, and that's been the problem with molecular taxonomy. If you choose one gene out of uh, two or 3,000 in a genome and try and classify it on that, you come up with one answer. If you pick another gene, you get a different tree. If you try and look at the genome as a whole, you get a totally different answer. So yes, we see genes moving around. You know, the, the visible world and these few visible species, to me, are, are somewhat uh, bizarre extremes of evolution. They're not the, the standard. But if you look in those, uh, in the marsupial versus, uh, uh, you know, a platypus uh, genome, uh, you would definitely find a clear-cut uh, similarity. If we sequenced another mammalian genome, we would not discover a single new gene. We would discover unique combinations that made that mammal versus us, but we have saturated the gene set for mammals. So we can, we can print out and say, but they, uh, uh, the gene set of mammals, uh, over half of those are shared broadly with other species. So you can't draw a bright line in every gene and say, these are plants and these are mammals. These are humans and these are marsupials. Because we've used, it gets back to the gene-centric view, we've used those in the random design of biology as we will use them in the very specific design that we do in the laboratory. And so taxonomy is something where people sort of fool themselves of justifying what they see with their visual acuity.